we had reports that Pentagon official is saying that U.S. is flowing munition to Israel. They're sending weapons to Israel. They're sending munition to Israel to fight sure. against these Palestinians who have nothing to fight against Israel. What's the strategy in your opinion? Why are they sending more weapons instead of going after some sort of ceasefire, some sort of negotiations? Well, I think it's a combination of two things. One, the political pressure in the United States. Um, you know, this has been this is true going back to at least 1973. So we're talking about 50 years of bipartisan support for Israel. And Israel has been very deft at uh, lining up political support in the United States using money contributions to members of Congress to to really influence the public debate. So you have this broad base of support in the United States. And then the mainstream media is going along with the narrative that uh, is painting Hamas as, you know, the consummate evil, uh, Israel as David against a Goliath, the terrorist Goliath, which is uh, just simply not true. And, uh, you know, the narrative is convincing most Americans who are frankly ignorant about the region. So in that context, then, you know, the Pentagon is basically pivoted from providing material support to Ukraine to providing that support that previously might have gone to Ukraine to Israel. Uh, you know, Israel's uh, needs to be restocked with bombs and rockets that are being fired on uh, the Palestinian positions throughout the Gaza Strip, particularly the northern part of Gaza. So it's just, you know, it's an escalation. Uh, there are increased signs that there is increasing pressure around the world diplomatically against the United States, condemning what the United States is doing as facilitating a war crime. And, you know, it, it's let, let's just stop and look at the math. Yes, there were upwards of maybe 1,400 Israelis killed on October 7th. Uh, of that number, maybe as many as half were killed by Israeli defense forces who, when they're going up against hostage positions, rather than negotiate, rather than uh, try to deal with Hamas, they just, they killed Hamas and in the process killed their own civilians. Compare, though, that number of dead Israelis with the number of dead Palestinians, particularly children. You know, the, chil the children alone that have died in these Israeli strikes is two and a half to three times more than what Israel lost on October 7th. So it's just, it's way, way uh, disproportionate. And uh, Israel's, you know, thinks that they can kill their way out of this. They never have. You know, they've they've been fighting this, these kinds of wars going back 70 years, 75 years. And, you know, the, they keep doing the same thing over and over on both sides. And it's not yielding anything but a, a larger body count. Why they're so obsessed with this northern part of Gaza? <laughs> no, I think they're uh, one uh, from looking at the map. It appears that there are more, let's call them f agricultural areas, farm fields that could be cultivated. So a little bit easier area to maneuver in in the north. Uh, I think also Israel wants to get a foothold there. That if they can s expel the Palestinians and the Palestinians don't return, then Israel can continue to gobble up more territory, put more settlers in. But, you know, the, what's happened is a lot of the settlers that used to be in the kibbutzim around the borders of Gaza are showing great reluctance about going back because uh, they don't have a lot of faith and trust in the Netanyahu government. You know, because Netanyahu already allowed one disaster to take place on October 7th. They don't have full confidence that he would not uh, allow another one to take place. How long they can keep this kind of behavior that they're committing right now? Well, as long as the United States continues to supply money and weapons, I think Israel can keep this up as long as its casualties are contained. But again, there are some indications that the casualties are mounting yeah, particularly as they move farther into more built up areas in Gaza. And even though they've they bombed and turned a lot of it into rubble, as we've talked before, that's what the, it's the Stalingrad effect. 
the, the Nazis, when they bombed Stalingrad, thought that they were destroying the Soviet army. And instead, they created natural defenses that the Soviets who were in Stalingrad could use to combat the Nazi troops. Well, the same thing's happening to the Israelis. Um the Hamas fighters and the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, because it's also PIJ, P-I-J, that's that's in Gaza as well as other groups. Uh, so they're using tunnels, they're using uh, bombed out buildings, and you know so far Israel has not been able to eradicate them. And you know um, Israel is recognizing that there are some true diplomatic costs. To pursuing this uh, this operation, and just today the bombing of the Al Shifa Hospital or around it and Al Ransi, which is a children's hospital, is really generating outrage, uh, particularly among UN officials. Um, so Israel will find itself increasingly isolated, but Israel doesn't seem to care. Uh, but uh, there are charges being, you know, people bringing charges against Israel in the international uh, court, accusing them of war crimes, which will make it very difficult for Israelis to travel anywhere but, say, Israel and the United States. If they go to other countries, they could uh, be picked up, arrested, and then hauled before that court to be tried. So, it, you know, Israel, uh, Israel is stubbornly, con you know, hanging on to this uh, line of uh, we're going to wipe out Hamas. Uh, but it remains to be seen if they can actually do that. How do you see Hezbollah right now? Nasrullah said that they're not going to escalate this conflict in Gaza. Are they going to sit back and see Israel do everything in that region? Is there any difference between what they're talking about and what's their behavior on the battlefield? They've not mobilized to the point of carrying out large-scale operations, but uh, they have been carrying out numerous attacks on Israeli military positions and settlements that are along the border with Lebanon. And Israel, in turn, has been retaliating, firing back into Lebanon. And then in response to that, Hezbollah is turning around, firing back into Israel, so this, this tit for tat has been going on and is escalating. It's, it's increasing, not diminishing. At the same time, the United States the other day has bombed, uh, you know, publicly announced that it bombed what they said was an Iranian weapons storage facility in Syria. And then in response to that, the next day, there were four uh, attacks on U.S. bases in Syria and Iraq. So again, it's, it's sort of a hidden war, a quiet war that's not getting much attention. I do know for a fact from a friend who is uh, actually has access at the Walter Reed Medical Center in Bethesda, Maryland. And it is uh, used to be called the Bethesda Naval Hospital, but now they've changed the name to Walter Reed. And it's, uh, it, it's where wounded U.S. soldiers go. And... Uh, my friend told me to, just three days ago that the number of increased, uh, there's been a significant increase in the number of wounded American soldiers coming in who have been wounded in these uh, bomb and rocket attacks in Syria and Iraq that have been launched by these uh, you know, groups that are considered linked to Iran. So the, and the Biden administration is going out of its way to not report on these casualties. So they're 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 trying to keep it in the dark. I think we'll we'll know more tomorrow when uh, Nasrallah gives his sermon. Uh, it was much much awaited last Friday. This will be equally, I think, awaited tomorrow to see if he's going to ratchet up the pressure or continue to sort of sit on the sidelines as the Israelis just uh, pound pound the life out of the Gaza Strip. From what we've seen so far in this conflict in Israel, when you divide this conflict in this political conflict and military conflict, at the end of the day, when this conflict ends, do you think that Israel is going to win militarily, diplomatically? How do you see this combination? I think actually Israel loses if they keep this up. But let's define what a victory would look like. A victory would be that Israel would be recognized as a nation that has a right to exist, 
and has uh, you know well-defined boundaries and is uh, you know welcomed among the nations of the world. And it was it was actually moving in that direction prior to October seventh, because remember they were working at you know sort of the follow-up to the Abraham Accords that had been negotiated under Donald Trump. Uh, it looked like the Saudis and Israelis were making some progress. But then, you know, Hamas happens on October 7th. And again, this there, there was a context because Israeli settlers had been moving in and occupying Arab lands, Palestinian lands, uh, that, uh, you know, for you know several years without giving it up. So the, those tensions were increasing. Well, well, now you've seen countries that previously would have the you know public relations with Israel or friendly relations with Israel, Jordan, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, uh, principally, uh, they're all back in white now. They're breaking off relations. South Africa breaking off relations. So Colombia, Chile, Honduras, Bolivia, Venezuela. So it's not just confined to one part of the world. It's it's happened sweeping across the world because the images of Israelis killing children is proliferating. It's gone viral. And Israel can claim, oh, we don't intend to kill children. Oh, it's, you know, casualties of war. Eh, people don't care. What they're seeing are these horrific images. And, you know, Israel is not showing the same number of images of dead children uh you know it, it started with that propaganda the lie that there were 40 babies beheaded which turned out to have been a complete fabrication so israel lost some credibility on that front as well so it's it's just you know the pr war israel's losing and if you lose the pr war it makes it very difficult to win the actual victory on the battlefield because at some point you're going to stop fighting and then you've got to start dealing with people on a political level. And if you poison that well, it's not clear that these other nations are going to suddenly turn around and it's OK, Israel, all is forgiven, come back in, sit at the table. Is there anything that Mahmoud Abbas can do to de-escalate this conflict in Gaza? I don't think there's much he can do. I mean, Abbas is, I think, a flawed, weak figure. Uh, he is not... He's seen, I think, more as a tool of the West, being more pliant uh, with uh, willing to cozy up to Washington and to London. Um, he's not seen as a strong leader advocating for the welfare of the Palestinians. He has, you know, as this conflict has, as this war has gone on, he has become more outspoken. But uh, there is no one natural leader yet among the Palestinian peoples. Uh, they're pretty divided. And they're not all Muslim. There are some Christians as well. And it, uh, uh, you know, there's, uh, is that fragmentation of the leadership that's actually made it difficult to work out a political solution. I think one of the things you've seen is over the, during this past week, when Bill Burns, CIA director, was in Qatar with the head of Mossad, that they're working with uh, Qatar, who's got direct contacts with Hamas, to try to find some negotiated solution to getting the hostages released that Hamas took, which I think you know was one of the primary military objectives Hamas had at the beginning, use those hostages as leverage to get its own people out of is, uh, Israeli prisons. Uh, whether Israel will agree to cut that kind of deal or not still remains to be seen. When you look at the last meeting of Antony Blinken with Mahmoud Abbas, he was talking about two-state solution. Do right. you think that the official U.S. policy in Gaza, in Israel, in Palestine would be two-state solution? Or is that that? Why do you keep talking about this if the Netanyahu administration doesn't accept it? It does not matter necessarily what Netanyahu wants or believes. Because his political position in Israel is not rock solid. It's very tenuous. Uh, he only really has a minority uh, or a plurality support. He does not have majority support. And uh, if the rest of the world lines up strongly in favor of a two-state solution, where they will both guarantee 
the security and survival of Israel, as well as the security and survival of Palestine, a new nation, uh, then I think that there is a potential for that agreement to ultimately be achieved. But it's not going to be achieved with Netanyahu, and it's going to uh, certainly anger uh, the, the ultra-right in Israel. But right now, the ultra-right is not the majority party. Uh, they are uh, a minority party. And, and so the domestic politics in Israel will, I think, be a huge factor here. And one thing that's going to drive that as well are the fate of the hostages and the number of casualties that Israeli defense forces are, are incurring with suffering themselves, number of killed and wounded, because Israel does not take losses lightly or easily. We had the Israeli minister advocating for bombing using nuclear bombs. Do you think that would escalate, that would mm. force these Arab states, Turkey, Iran in that region to go after nuclear bombs? Because at the end of the day, they understand the threat that comes from Israel for them in their opinion. Well, let's yeah, let's be clear what he was. So he's on a radio interview, so sort of doing like what you and I are doing right now, chatting and uh, the guy who was, let's call him the Nima on that that interview, asked him, you know, well, could you see a possibility of using a nuke in 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 Gaza? And he said, yeah, yeah, that's it's it's one possibility. Throwing it out there, not saying yeah, we're going to. The the real error he committed there was acknowledging that Israel has nukes. You know, up to this point, the Israelis have been very cagey about not admitting that they actually have nuclear weapons. It's, you know, sort of one of those things that people assume, but no Israeli official will admit it. Well, this guy then tacitly admitted it. That's why you saw ben Benjamin Netanyahu come out immediately and denounce this guy. He denounced him, but he didn't fire him, and they didn't remove him from his job. So, um, but, but again, it shows the mindset of some of the people around Bibi Netanyahu. They have zero tolerance they they use language towards the palestinians that if you if you just took the words that they said about wanting to do what they want to do to the palestinians and you change the word israeli to nazi and you change the word palestinian to jew it is the same way the nazis talked about what they were going to do to the jews that's what the, the Israelis are doing to the Palestinians. And I know some people may be offended at that comparison, but it, it's it, it's an absolute, it's, it's the bitter irony of this. Because Israel has in the past shown that it was better than this. You know, that when they, when, when they uh, captured Adolf Eichmann, who was, you know, labeled as one of the masterminds of the final solution, they did not drag his body behind a car. They didn't set him on fire and tear him apart. They put him on trial and had him confront the witnesses to his horrors and to his complicity, complicity in those murders. And then he was executed, but at least he received a measure of justice that it wasn't just done out of emotion or arbitrary um, act. But you know what's going on right now is is so emotional on both sides, uh, and and uh, you know this is the, the bitterness and the, that the Palestinians are going to feel out of this. That's not going away. Uh, the, the you know this the, the the West does not understand a lot of times some of the Middle Eastern culture. Uh, I recall a, one of my one of my CIA colleagues. Uh, his specialty was working with. Uh, he was running uh, Iranian assets. And one day they had a meeting set up and the guy came in and was all emotionally upset. He was distraught. And my friend said, well, what's wrong? He goes, oh, this it was this murder, this massacre of these women and children. And, you know, the, 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 there were the thousands that were killed. And my friend went, well, I haven't heard about that. And he starts, how many were killed? And he writes it down. And where did this taste take place? And the guy gave him the location. He goes, now, when did this happen? The guy sat back and goes, uh, it was about 800 AD or 800 CE, you know, current era. Now, 
in his mind, it was fresh. It was current. It had happened more than a thousand years ago, but he was still remembering and, the, and grieving over it. And there is unfortunately that mentality in the Middle East that what Israel has done is going to require revenge and revenge will be taken. And the same thing on the Israeli side, they don't forget they're going to carry out revenge. So the, somehow trying to break this cycle of violence, that's that's the real challenge. This shows how the region is going to be radicalized. It's a disaster for that region. In, in, yes. Yeah. Uh, well, unbelievable. I mean, that's, yeah, that's the concern. I know that you've had uh, Doug McGregor and Scott Ritter and others on as well. And I think what has all of us so worried is that in the past, the United States was able to play divide and conquer. We would keep the Sunni pitted against the Shia, the Persian pitted against the Arab, the Arab pitted against the Turk, the Turk pitted against the Kurd. What you're seeing now is a unity, those divisions that they're still they're still there in some form or facet. But the reality is you're now seeing Turkey and the Arabs and this, the Muslims and the Persians, they're, they're starting to speak with one voice about condemning what Israel is doing to the Palestinian people and condemning it in a way that we've never seen this kind of strength of unity in their comments. So and, and some in the West try to dismiss it. Oh, they, you know, they're just Arabs. What are they, you know, they, they're, they're inconsequential. No, I don't believe that. Uh, and I think we make a very grave error if we assume that they're not serious, I know that some look at the what Erdogan in Turkey has said, and just said, well, he's he's always known as a bombast and shoots his mouth off, but he's not going to act. Uh, well, let's hope he doesn't act because if he does act, then all of a sudden the entire strategic picture of the world changes. If NATO is in chaos, and Israel is outmatched militarily. And then the prospect of other nations coming into that war, all of a sudden, you know, we're looking at, you know, a genuine, you know, World War III, a genuine conflagration. And, uh, you know, it's, it's very, very dangerous. The economy of Israel, this 40% of the oil that goes to Israel comes from Azerbaijan, passes through Turkey. Turkey is so right, important right. in this calculation, but it seems they don't, <clears throat> understand the role of turkey they there is no communications between turkey and the west especially the u.s it was some sort of talking but these talkings are not getting anywhere we'll find out if turkey is just all talk or they're going to actually do something because as you correctly note if they cut off the oil to israel israel then has a problem and uh it's already suffering economically because it is uh, the number of reserves that were activated and if, if Hezbollah decides to really ramp things up and expand an offensive on the northern border, Israel's going to be hard-pressed to fight a two-front war. Uh, it, its resources will be stretched to the max, and it, it will, uh, you know, going to raise some real issues that would, you know, I think generate pressure to get rid of Bibi Netanyahu and try to work out a political deal behind the scenes that would get the you know everybody back in their box and to stop fighting. In the aftermath of this conflict, how do you see the future of Netanyahu? I don't think he has a future. The recriminations will become, uh, I guess, larger, louder in the coming weeks, because Israeli casualties are going to increase. There's a, they're not going to diminish, and uh, more witnesses will come forward about the failure of the Israeli forces to both anticipate or listen to warnings about the impending attack on October 7th, and then the, the ensuing response where Israeli defense forces were, you know, frankly, very careless, and they needlessly killed uh, Israeli civilians in their attempt to quash uh, the Hamas invasion. Let's shift the gear to Ukraine war. We had some reports that the Zelensky's office is trying to silence Zeluzhny. What's the reason <laughs> of this conflict within the Zelensky administration? Did you say there is a war in Ukraine? Gee, we, have, we haven't been hearing about that. <laughs> yeah, so 
Um, the, there's a lot of, uh, let's call them balls in the air, the things in play uh, that you've seen a d- d- direct uptick in leaks to the media, both in the United States and in the UK, portraying the situation in Ukraine uh, vis-a-vis Russia as desperate and getting worse. Uh, Zaluzhny was featured in The Economist magazine last week. Both he was interviewed, he then wrote an op-ed that was published in The Economist magazine, as well as he wrote a longer piece that was published online by The Economist. Now, uh, you know, Zaluzhny just wasn't sitting, you know, sitting in his office saying, boy, who, who, who would I like to be interviewed by? Oh, I know it. I'll call up The Economist. No, The, the Economist reached out to him, and they would not have done so without the blessing of British intelligence, MI6, because the British intelligence is the big one of the big forces behind this war in Ukraine. And I think British intelligence recognizes that the 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 usefulness of Zelensky, uh, the little Jewish comedian, is is over, and that they need somebody like Zeluzny to uh, take a, a bigger role. So I think this was a push to get Zeluzny out there because at the same time that this Economist article is appearing, you get the Time Magazine piece that is. 180 degrees from what Time Magazine did a year ago, when they put, published the, you know, Zelensky is man of the year, Churchill reincarnated, uh, you know, the, they made him sound like the the little brother of Jesus Christ. He was he was all wise, all seeing, all knowing, you know, tremendous strategist. Now in this latest Time piece, boy, he's he's delusional. He's like he's like Adolf Hitler in his last days. So it was it, not even to call it uncomplimentary is to be generous. It was a vicious, savage attack on Zelensky. Well, why did that happen? Well, again, Time Magazine's getting fed that information by people in the Biden administration and probably some even from the British government. So they're sending the clear message again that Zelensky's time is up. Then the NBC News uh, article came out about uh, their. T- you know, negotiations, encouraging some negotiations to get underway. Well, Zelensky wasn't consulted and all that. They, you know, whoever was leaking that were just sending a clear message that Zelensky is not in our, you know, line of communication on this anymore. So all of this is reflecting that I think Zelensky's days are numbered. Then you had uh, that uh, hand grenade gift. And there's still the whole story about that is is unclear. Uh, the aid a major to uh, ge- uh, an, an aide to General Zelensky or General Zaluzhny uh, went off uh, on his birthday. Now it's, it's unclear. I've, I've heard so many different variations of the story. We don't even have a correct version. Uh, some say it was, you know, there's a picture of four hand grenades sitting on a table that may have been taken before the devices went off. Uh, it was uh, apparently given to him by another senior uh, assistant to uh, Zaluzhny, a guy named Timchenko. Uh, then it's described as, no, oh, no, they were shot glasses in the shape of grenades. Well, it certainly didn't, you know, these didn't look like shot glasses. Uh, it, it, it was clearly not a booby trap. And what I mean by a booby trap, if you, you I'm going to give you a bust of the, the head of uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, a statue, but I'm going to build an explosive in that, give it to you, boom, it blows up. That's a booby trap. Well, these were actual grenades, and it looks like they were live grenades. Um, it, you know, it may have been he just, you know, was completely careless and thought it was a gag gift and pulled a pin on it, and boom, went off. So we don't know. Some, some are saying, oh, it was designed to send a message to Zaluzhny. Well, yeah, there is infighting between uh, Zaluzhny and Zelensky. And, uh, you know, I think it's it's just a matter of time before uh, Zelensky is gone. We're going to have to, we need somebody without a Z in their name. Maybe with, all the, with these Zelensky's illusions, we're all getting confused. It's a good grief. Let's get someone named, you know, uh, Abramovitz or something. If MI6 
prefer Zaluzhny over Zelensky? What would Zaluzhny do that would be different from what Zelensky is doing right now? Probably negotiate with Russia and find a negotiated solution. You know, I think one of the reasons Zelensky's holding on is the sort of the powers behind the throne that have put him there uh, are, are this ultra right wing zealots. And they have no interest at all in negotiating with Russia. And that were he to attempt to do so, they'd kill him. So, you know, this the, what's going to dictate this ultimately, though, is the military picture on the ground. And you know, at every juncture, Ukraine is losing personnel. They're losing manpower. And uh, they, they don't um, they they don't have the wherewithal to survive because they they don't have the manpower. They don't have the reinforcements. Uh, so uh, they're, they're, they're losing. They're hoping that Russia is going to shut down operations and not continue pushing forward. I think that's. I don't think Russia is going to slow up at all. You know, if you remember a year ago, they didn't slow up in the Battle of Bakhmut in January or February, despite it being winter, kept it on until Bakhmut fell. Uh, the fall of, of Divka right now, which is anticipated to take place maybe within the next week or two, will be devastating for the Ukrainian military uh, position. Uh, it's going to collapse a lot of lines and it will increase the pressure on Ukraine to come to a negotiated settlement. And, you know, in the past, you know, Ukraine at least could count on NATO and the United States and the United Kingdom being sort of singularly focused on them. They're an afterthought. They're, you know, they're at the back of the bus. Uh, they're, they're no longer a priority. And, you know, Zelensky's trying to figure out some way to make them relevant again. And I, I don't see how that happens. Do we see any sort of willingness on the part of Russians to go after negotiations for the time being? Or they're going to capture more territories like Nikolaev, <clears throat> Odessa, and after that they may go after negotiations? The Russians are open to negotiations, but on their terms. They're under no pressure domestically or internationally to cave. Uh, they're going to get what they want now. Uh, they're going to make Ukraine pay a price. And I think that price will include uh, Odessa and Kharkiv, along with uh, Kherson, Zaporizhia, the Donetsk, and Luhansk, uh, former republics that are now uh, federations, part of the Russian Federation. Uh, it remains to be seen what sort of condition the Ukrainian government's left in, because the, the population has almost been cut in half. The number of casualties killed in action and wounded in action combined is well over a million, uh, which is a, an enormous number. And their financial situation is, is ba basically devastating because they've lost factories, plants, mining facilities that were all in eastern Ukraine that are now under the control of the Russians. So, uh, and, and the ability of the West to continue pouring money into Ukraine is in question now. Uh, you've just saw the U U.S. Uh, Agency for uh, International Development, USAID, testified that they're, they're out of money. They don't have any more money to send Ukraine until Congress moves to appropriate more. And that football is getting kicked around in Washington, D.C., because Israel is going to get the priority and the Republicans want something out of the Biden administration, such as the action on the border before they're going to write a check uh, to Ukraine, much less, uh, you know, Israel gets first steps and then Ukraine gets, comes in second. From what we've seen so far in Ukraine, can we say that the Ukraine case is totally dead for the U.S. foreign policy? Can we draw that conclusion? Well, what has been U.S. policy towards Ukraine is going to have to change. Uh, the U.S. policy has been based on a fantasy, a delusion that Russia's weak, Russia's losing, Putin has cancer, the Russian defense industry is shoddy and incapable of keeping pace with the West, uh, that the Russian military is weak, poorly led, poorly equipped, et cetera, et cetera. Well, those are all lies. And the West is now having to come to grips with the fact that 
uh, Russia has reemerged as a, a world power, a world economic power, a world military power. In fact, it was it, it reminded me that scene of that scene in Lord of the Rings, you know, the trilogy where King Denethor, who had been under the influence of Saruman, the, 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 the wizard, and he looks old and ragged. And it's only when they wake him up from that curse, they break the curse, and he all of a sudden returns to his youth and vitality. That's sort of what has happened to Russia. It had labored under that illusion that it needed the West, that it was dependent in some form or fashion on the West. And the West, boy, fed it that lie. And then comes the special military operation, come the sanctions, and the sanctions keep on coming. What's happened is Russia all of a sudden is, is awakened and realizes we didn't need them. Our economy is strong enough as it is. They need us more than we need them. And I think that that change of mentality for Russia's standpoint is going to require the United States to come to grips with that. You know, eventually we're going to have to talk to Russia. You see that there are plans right now for uh, Biden to meet with Xi Jinping next week or the week after in San Francisco. Uh, but I think, you know, one of the elements of that is Xi Jinping is going to be delivering a message that you know, you're going to have to deal with. You know, basically, you're going to have to deal with Russia. You're not going to deal with us alone. When we look at Chuck Schumer and Mitch McConnell, who wanted to send a strong message to China from the Ukraine war, what kind of message they have sent to China so far? They remind me of Wile E. Coyote from the Roadrunner cartoon movies, where the coyote is always trying to trap the Roadrunner and it keeps blowing up. It keeps dropping a rock on its head. That's what McConnell and Schumer did. Uh, and their efforts to punish China, isolate China, punish Russia, and um, isolate it, they've made Russia and China an alliance. This is uh, both de facto and real. So uh, what you're seeing here is that Russia and China are now working together to counter U.S. influence in the world. And the U.S. is desperately to trying to get that, you know, get them back in the box where the, the West can control what happens to Russia and China. That's not going to happen. We're in a new age. And Russia and China are going to demand, you're going to respect us. You're going to treat us with the respect that we deserve, or we're not going to deal with you. I, I think it's going to be in those kinds of stark terms. When we look at Ukraine, look at Africa, right now in the Middle East, with this conflict in Israel, do you think that these countries, especially Middle Eastern countries, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, UAE, these countries are going to shift toward the East, toward Russia and China, and getting less connected, less dependent on the U.S.? How do you see yeah. the future of these countries? No, that's exactly what's happening. You know, they've already uh, several countries they've lined up to join BRICS. So it's not it's no longer not just Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. Brazil part of it. Saudi Arabia wants to be part of it. Uh, I suspect Turkey will want to be part of it. So you're all of a sudden seeing this move of of these countries that before it was just it was like okay, the U.S. is a superpower. We're going to have to sort of kowtow to it uh you know we'll have to uh, you know take our medicine as it were uh bitter though it may be no longer you know, there are genuine there are now genuine alternatives to the united states and the other thing is people are just growing sick and tired of the hypocrisy of the united states you know we had the video of john kirby weeping crocodile tears over the you know the russians killing children in ukraine oh it was you know, he was very emotional. And then when you have, you know, literally 20 to 30 times the number of children killed in in, in Gaza in, a, in one month, he, he's, he's very, very cold and matter of fact. You know, where they, they want to condemn Russia for certain things that they give Israel a pass on. The rest of the world's sick and tired of that hypocrisy. And they're, they're not putting up with it anymore. They're starting to walk away. When you consider Russia, China, 
U.S. They have nuclear bombs. It's their upper hand, their advantage on the other countries. But if they make some sort of partnership between the Middle Eastern countries, Russia and China, an attack on one country would be an attack on all of them. Yeah. Or think that they're not going after nuclear bombs. It, it's going to be a new partnership that provides some sort of security for that region. Well, w- what we've seen is that if a country has a nuclear weapon, it's less likely to be invaded or attacked directly. So that was, you know, Afghanistan, they had no nukes, they got attacked. Iraq, no nukes, they got attacked. Panama, no nukes, it was attacked. You know, Somalia, no nukes. Syria, no nukes. Libya, no nukes. Pakistan, nukes. India, nukes. Israel, nukes. Uh, and, you know, now you've got uh, Pakistan telling Turkey, hey, if you are attacked or uh, provoked in any way, we'll share our nukes with you. So, you know, that that's pretty alarming. Uh, you know, the, the, the use of nuclear weapons is it, it's crossing a threshold that will be, you know, you, know, you can't uncross it once you go, once you do it, pass over that threshold. And that uh, the, the potential now for it to escalate. It's one thing for the United States to have dropped the atomic bombs when we were the only ones in the world with atomic bombs and nobody else could do anything in response. That's not the case now. And the uh, the potential to destroy significant parts of the United States or China or Russia are real. And uh, if that happens, it would be devastating. Then we'd have genuine climate change in in a very uh, dangerous way. In your opinion, what lesson the Taiwanese going to learn, going to get from these conflicts in Ukraine and now in Israel? I think they're going to be very cautious about trusting the United States. Uh, any promises that the United States has made to take those with a grain of salt. Uh, two, I think um, China is quite content to wait this out politically and take control of Taiwan politically instead of doing it through military action. Uh, the, you know, the United States is going out of its way to try to provoke, uh, create incidents with China. And China has been, you know, very careful about its responses, uh, because even though China is having some economic problems at home, uh, it's still the, this alliance with Russia. It is it's looking at the world in a new way, and the language that, that we use in the United States to describe t- China is, you know, it's divorced from reality. We portray China as this relentless imperialist power bent on controlling the world. Well, how many countries has China invaded over the last 40 years? The answer is none. Whereas you can say, which country has been invading the most other nations? As I've said before on your program, well, it's the United States. If you want to make the argument, who is the imperialist power that's been using military force to try to impose its will around the world? That's the United States. That's not Russia. That's not China. And so Russia and China are sort of pushing back uh, against the United States trying to portray them to create the narrative that China and Russia are that thing which the United States actually is. How do you see the role of India? It seems to me that they are walking on the road. They want to have both sides. Are they going to be more connected, more economic ties with the West, with the East? How do you see their future? India has got you know sort of two issues that are contentious with China, border dispute on one side, and then with Pakistan on the other side, going back, you know, historically to the split up of that British empire. Um, The situation in Palestine is creating some issues, I think, for the government of Modi, because the the Muslims that control or are dominant in the western part of India are quite upset and outraged by this. Um, So it's, it's sort of stoking religious tensions, the sectarian tensions that do exist in India between Muslims and Hindus. You know, that's not easily papered over. That's one one thing that uh, Modi needs to navigate and try to keep in the box. And then the second is the tensions with China and the border dispute. So the, the good news with BRICS is that perhaps BRICS provides a vehicle where at least those disputes with China can be uh, settled in a, in a diplomatic form. And then 
uh, India still has to turn and try to deal with the sectarian divide within its own country. And, and then, as we know, those there's no easy solution to those. Those are those are worked out over the course of time. It's just hoping that nobody sets a match to it and lights it off.